Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to see all of you here. My name is Nandraja Prasanna. I'm a consultant emergency physician attached to the Lady G Hospital Children Accident Service. Today's lectures on how to use your smart devices and the internet to you know do the best for your patients as well as to improve your own self professionally. So the reasons for this topic is it's pretty simple to understand. I mean, this is the digital age. Everybody is carrying their own cell phones and everybody has access to Google and all information available on the internet. So we also need to be up to date to that. Technology makes it easy if you know how we, um, if you know how to use it. And also something that would come, will definitely come later. We'll be dealing with patients and we have an obligation to maintain patient privacy. So we need to be aware of that as well few disclaimers before we move on. Uh, I do not have any financial connections or anything from the websites or apps that I discussed down here. You need to make sure the patient privacy is being maintained and also when you access the websites or the resources here you need to understand that um, you may still need to correlate the information to the patient in front of you rather than just taking what's being said there. Right. So we'll be looking at four major topics. The first one would be the use of a uh, smart device in the emergency department. The second one is when uh, the, the like good usages when you discharge these patients and also when you transfer them. Fourth, uh, sorry, third, we'll uh, discuss about the patient privacy laws, uh, common ones in Sri Lanka. And last, we'll have a look at few useful online apps and websites that you can use in your practice. So how can you use your smart device in emergencies? So you can use them when you're obtaining history. You can use them when you're uh, getting the past important past medical investigations. And also you can use them in management and documentation. Um, it's pretty straightforward uh, when you get the history, especially in an emergency when you can't get open, the patient doesn't have capacity or when they are unconscious. You can call the next of kin or some emergency contact on the phone and they can get the history from them. Uh, always remember that you need to establish the patient first before you get the history. The one thing that you might find a bit useful, especially when you get people uh, like uh, India, like people from India or from Middle East who speak Hindi or Arabic or Chinese, you can use the Translate app. So there's one in app one for Apple and one for Google as well. So you can use this app to get near perfect translation of uh, medical documentation as well as uh, you can also talk to them as well. You can use, I mean, in your mobile device, you can use your browser and go to the website. But I think the best benefit would be to get down the app uh, because it makes things easier. Uh, and you can also get this real-time translation. So you can talk to the app and then it will translate it and you know uh, play it back to the patient. So you can do this back and forth conversation. And if you got any deaf patients, currently Dialog has unveiled a, a, a website called Deaf Talk. That is Deaf T A W K. You can also use that. The other thing that you can you do is. You can get a video call for, uh, with uh, one of the patients next of kin and sort of make them do the sign language so you can get the information from them. So this here is the app translate app from Apple and you can see on the right side this is the real time translation app. So you press the record button, you speak into the mic and when you stop it, it will automatically translate it and it will also have a voice play back to your patient so you can speak back and forth. It has, it doesn't work for main, uh, it has a good set of languages so most of the languages like um, Arabic Chinese Japanese French everything is in there so it makes things a bit more easier but it does I mean it does not really cover all language under the Sun but you should be able to get most of the important ones especially ones who come to Sri Lanka the second feature in the same app is you can take the photos or you can um, you can take a real-life photo or you can just uh, get the uh, picture from the patient and use the app change the necessary languages and you can see it does this translation on top of that uh, so which is a bit useful now you had to be careful here because some of I mean these apps learn with the translation and the corrections that people make so medical translation may not be very accurate but you should be able to get the gist of most of the things that have been done now other ways that you can use is now when you get this uh, poisonings or any bites, toxic bites, any snakes or plants, any leaves and anything like that. What you can do is you can take a photo and do a Google reverse image search. 
It's easy if you still got the app in with you. So you take a photo of the plant or the snake, you do a reverse uh, image search and it gives a reasonably good um, finding. So you should be able to find that plant reasonably, reasonably well enough. And still you can also send it to your specialist or uh, the toxicologist on call to get an opinion as well. And when you get medication, um, significant medication over dosages and sometimes your patients do not carry the names or the labels, just bag of pills, uh, you can use the pill identifier app in the Medscape website. So this does, I mean, you have to enter the size, size shapes, colors, and the imprints, and it gives a reasonably well uh, for the most of the major medications. Mm. You do run into trouble when you have medication which are not really like used in USA or new ones from India or made in Sri Lanka, but most of the time you can find major important medications like warfarin. So my, my, my experience, we have been able to find warfarin. Uh, and antidepressants, right? And to you, sometimes you may need to look at the past medical investigations to make clinical decisions. Now you can ask the uh, next of kin or relations or the patients to show it on their phone. When you ask them to send it to, uh, like, try to access it, please get the verbal permission beforehand, and always try to get it down on the patient's phone rather than your phone um, because of the privacy issues. So avoid using your own personal device. Avoid using your own personal email. Try to involved it in the person the patient's device as much as you can right and in when it comes to documentation most of the hospitals major hospitals now have started using HHIMS system so you can use them in your documentation ideally you should be having a smart device supplied by your hospital just to you know be compliant with the privacy laws uh, but you can take uh, any injuries, pictures of injuries uh, with forensic value or anything in your phone if, in, if you think it needs an emergency management. But you need to get the patient's or next of kin's permission afterwards and also delete the images after you know you have used it. Also, if you get any, especially in pediatrics, so if you get any seizure patient, it's good to uh, document the seizures in the patient's phone or the parent's phone uh, to have them keep a clip of that seizure activity because it may be useful when they have their follow-up with their neurologist just to see if the semiology has changed right and when the other thing that you can do is especially when you manage pediatric patients you need to find out the weight based medication you need to calculate the weight uh, the medication according to the patient's weight what you can do is you can always google search the monash uh, pediatric drug book it leads you to the site and uh, you, you can see that it shows uh, medication according to the body weight which you can use this is most useful for most of the emergencies and if you want to refer any managements, you can also look up at the Royal Children's Hospital website or the Don't Forget, Forget the Bubbles website. If you want to refer up any um, pediatric emergency management and if you can't get hold of your seniors, you can look up in the Royal Children's Hospital website or the uh, Don't Forget the Bubbles website. But please be aware that, you know, they are made for their own hospital setting. So you have to be a bit more diligent in identifying that and, you know, adapt it to the user at your hospital and to your patient and most of the adult emergencies you can refer to the life in the fast lane rebel em or the first 10 em websites for adult emergencies and you go radiopedia which is a good reference to looking up at images to see if there's any um, uh, rare f fractures or anything like that if you are dealing with orthopedics and fractures you can always refer to the ortho bullets website uh, or there's an app called the fractures app to see what the problems are and what's the basic management for that. You, Like I told you before, remember these were made for most of the developed countries. So you and we are still working with the ministry to make up our own such protocols and guidelines. Some are, come, some are already there, some are coming up, but till it becomes uh, well established, you have to be a bit more careful in using the Western resources. Now, if you can afford, you can use paid apps now you got the up-to-date where most of the medical and the surgical registers use <clears throat> the postgres do get it free of charge but from us we are from lower middle income countries you can apply and get it free of charge uh, use for free of charge for some time that's also the copendium website from mrap it lets you access the uh, uh, the early rapid access part free of charge but it does have a really good detailed management option as well and there's also the uh, electronic therapeutic guidelines from australia and if you're 
dealing with pediatrics, you can use the parent's phone as the, or the iPad as a distraction device. You can put it to YouTube, show some cartoons, uh, and you know let them watch it while you do your assessment. Right. So that's mostly for the emergencies. Now, when you are planning to discharge the patient or transferring them, there are a few things that you can do that will um, sort of help the patient down the line. Now, we are moving towards a digital health record system. Most of the hospitals do have an HHIMA system in the government sector and we should be able to get all the details from around the country but we are still uh, developing it on the building stage so a little bit of distance to go so what you can tell your patients is um, I mean if you do work in such places ask them to keep a picture of the barcode in their phones and if they got any children or elderly people you can always ask the the family members to keep the children's cards in their uh, pictures in their phone as well so it's just a matter of easy reference otherwise you'll be ending up having multiple entries for the same patient and you may not be able to re review the past admissions and and when it comes to adults, especially in emergencies, sometimes you need to see the, the previous, the old baseline ECG to make uh, decisions like if the patient already has a left bundle branch block or already has had an atrial fibrillation or already has he had any white uh, QRS complexes which is a bit uh, important making decisions. So when you discharge your patients, you can ask them to take photos of their ECGs taken during that admission and keep it on the phone for later reference. Uh, especially when you have this 12 lead long strips which is very difficult to laminate as well. So encourage your patients to take photos of their ECGs and major CTs and keep it in their phones. Um, and when, it, when you come back to pediatric patient, the other uh, useful thing is you get patients with rashes. So what you can do is once you start the management over one, when you're sending them home, encourage the parents to take photos of the rash and keep it on the phone. So if they represent elsewhere or if we are reviewing them later in a week's time, it's easy to make a comparison between day one and you know day seven. So uh, encourage the parents to keep the photos on their phone. Um, and discharge advisors, well, we are working towards creating this uh, island-wide discharge advice for most of the common presentations. But till that's available, you can use the uh, Royal Children's Hospital website or the national, the UK and NHS website to look for any discharge advices and you can use that to give it to your patients. Now, when it comes to privacy, uh, maintaining patient privacy, it's it's a very important thing to know. It's a very, imp uh, I'm sorry. When it comes to patient privacy, it's a very important thing to know. It's a big deal in the developed countries. It is a big deal in our country as well, but we are most of us are unaware on what you actually need to do, right? So let's take the developed countries now. Patient privacy applies to all the patients, all the situations. We can take a little bit of leeway. We can tweak it here and there in like severe emergencies, but still at the end of the day, you had to make sure the patient privacy is being maintained. If you take photos on your device or on the hospital devices, uh, you need to have a written permission form maintaining the patient's records as well. You should only take what is needed just the minimum necessary information in your photo uh, that should enable to make the clinical decision you don't you should not take more than what's needed and you should only share it share it with people who will be uh, directly involved in the patient's subsequent care so you are not going to share it with too many people and if it's available try to use the institutional devices as well as the ins institutional emails rather than using your personal device and personal emails and you should understand like once we enable the uh, digital health record system you can you or you should only access uh, records of patients who are under your direct care so if you're a shift worker you can only access patient whom you see in that shift uh, you should not access records from others you can't even access your own records without permission from higher-ups now saying that in emergency situations you can sort of have a bit of a leeway you can take pictures of uh, ischemic stroke to show to the CT or to the center of the news because these are time sensitive but you do I mean after the management is done patients stabilized you will come back and do the proper protocols and you also should make sure that the images are deleted from your phone. If you want to read more on that, you can read the Caldigot guidelines uh, from the UK or the NHS, which gives a good idea on that. 
and hopefully that will be the system that we'll be basing on ourselves as well. Right, so how does that work in Sri Lanka? Well, it's still being developed, it's going to take some time. So having that in mind, the practice from my health staff need to change. At the moment, I can, uh, from what I can discuss from my colleagues, there are two acts available in Sri Lanka. The recent one was back in 2022. So the first one was the Electronic Transactions Act. The second one, recent one, is the Personal Data Protection Act, which was back in 2022, which uh, is going to apply to our patients as well. So remember, it's nearly the same. So you're going to focus on the most important information out of it you don't you're not going to take too many information but only the relevant information you can't share personal information without the patient's consent and if you can see here in in the 2022 act if you breach the patient confidentiality you are liable to be fined up to 1 million per each compliant so each non-compliant breach that means like if you send pictures of two patients then you'll be liable to pay 1 million plus 1 million 2 million so uh, just a few important things out of the last act so so that i mean if you go through the summary they are trying to establish uh, authority and they have given up the the function of the authority as well as the fines and punishments uh, the gist of it is you still should only get the basic minimum necessary information out of your patient and you can't share the patient patient's personal information without their explicit consent and if you are found to be breaching this um, trust or if you are being non-compliant with this act, you would be liable to be uh, fined up to 1 million rupees per each breach of data. So if you had done or if you had transfer, sent it twice, then you, you, know, you would be paying twice the amount. Right, and let's look at few useful online websites and apps that you can use. So something that's good happened in the last decade is the rise of the free online access med uh, medicine and the medical education. There are so many uh, free access sites which are really good and peer reviewed as well. You have access to websites as well as good podcasts as well. All right, so I'll start with the most famous one out of them, Life in the Fast Lane, uh, which is a really good uh, peer reviewed website. As you can see from all the topics here, it has got critical care, radiology, ultrasound, ECG, so many topics that uh, they discuss about and this got really interesting other reads as well like the, uh, the Friday 5 uh, topics or the uh, eponyms one. So and it's, it's, uh, it's a really easy or interesting way to look at the management as well. The second one would be the Academic Life in Emergency Medicine or shortly called LEM. Uh, it's more academic uh, medicine oriented but they do have really good output so if you go through the site you'll see this uh, dif different sex uh, chapters for different types of uh, things that you need to look up to and then you have the mdocs website the rebel am or the first 10 am you can just google them and you land up in that site they have clear concise information they are mostly peer reviewed and some of them do have the, this really nice infographics which lets you you know get the gist of things much more easier than rather than reading through many pages <coughs> all right and if you are involved in pediatrics um, one of the interesting one with the don't forget the bubbles that is the dftb.com which deals with many interesting pediatric topics and has uh, discussions on recent journal updates as well the second good one is something out of uh, australia that's uh, pem that's pediatric emergency medicine pem edu.net which is a collection of all the pediatric teaching that happens in Australia and has a collection of good reference websites as well. And last, you can refer the Royal Children's Hospital guidelines, which is free of charge, well, free of charge uh, on managing most pediatric emergency medicine management. And they got really good reading on pain relief as well as sedation as well. Now, this is the uh, Monash Children's gu guideline that I talked about previously. So you can just Google Monash Children's weight drugs guideline and you'll end up in this page and all you need to do is uh, confirm the patient's weight and click on it and you'll have a pdf listing all the important medication and doses 
related to different conditions, sorry, different emergency management. And in orthopedics, uh, most of the orthopedics uh, or, uh, orthopedic surgeons that, uh, that I know use ortho bullets. Uh, there's also the splinter site in LEM, and there's also this really good app uh, which is being made by a uh, app developer who has started emergency medicine so the fractures app where you can sort of click together and it will sort of guide you towards what management or plast or cast that you need to use uh, mind you still it's being adapted it's targeted for a developed country we still use pop pop cast but if you have in a far away place without access to orthopedics so you can refer to them this is something you can read up to and if you got any dermatological conditions dermnetnz.org is or dermnet is a really good site to refer refer it so they you can go with the cases or you can go to the anatomical areas and you can some i mean if you refer that with your patient you should be able to come to the diagnosis or at least a close approximation of what you are dealing with and if you go if you're going to refer a radiology you can use the radio pd look up to, uh, the typical x-rays and ct findings and i would suggest that you look up in radiopedia because they got these really good teaching courses that are being offered free of charge for low middle income countries uh, so you can just write up to them and once you give them proof that you're working in Sri Lanka they give you this free of charge for you and if you are on Google like your Android or uh, Apple I would suggest to refer up the apps made by Tom Ferriel so the fractures app was, app was made by him you can also see that he's got really uh, simple easy to use apps for nerve blocks or ECGs and sutures as well so, which is like easy, you can use it as a learning tool as well. Right, and when it comes to paid apps, now uh, when it comes to paid apps, the difficulty is most of them are targeted for developed countries and you need to pay about probably about 400 to 800 dollars per year, which is a bit too much for a financial capacity in, for doctors in Sri Lanka. But most, some of them do offer free subscription for doctors from LMIC countries, so you can use that. Uh, most of us used up to date, so it was given us free of charge for registrars when you're doing postgrads, but you can apply in and there's a chance you can get it free of charge to use. Uh, the only, I wouldn't say trouble, but yeah, the, um, I did have trouble in finding an app to refer medications like you know to refer medications, medication side effects, dosages and stuff uh, because they are always behind a paywall. I mean that would app I mean that that would make sense because all this costs money and stuff for people to review all these medication side effects and update them. So we don't have a really good uh, free app. So we had to rely on paid apps here. And you now those are all apps and websites. Now podcast it depends on the requirement. So there are podcasts from basic uh, studies and physiology up to <coughs> specialist level. It depends now if you are sort of the person who lis likes to listen while they are driving or you know spend time listening to podcasts when they do some work they are pretty useful you have the mcrit which is very useful for the critical care and emergency medicine people and then there's the crackcast part of canadian em podcast where they have a uh, podcast re uh, referring to chapters from rose and emergency medicine which is a really good way to update you on um, emergency medicine chapters uh, they they are free they are well known just that the recent updates are a bit lacking so they don't get much uh, information or much new updates these days the other one is ECG weekly so ecgweekly.com so it's a site which takes really interesting ECGs taken from emergency departments uh, like really relevant ones useful ones common ones as well as uh, the near miss ones which you are really afraid to miss and they discuss it in a very nice way in a video about 20 to 30 minutes it's just got a nominal fee about 28 uh, dollars per year but still worth it so you get a video released each uh, week uh, which you know discusses all this it's been run by dr Ama, uh, sorry professor amal matu he's a uh, uh, good authority on this emergency medicine uh, emergency ecgs and there's also mrap uh, it's expensive to a sri lankan but you can apply through the mrap go website for a free subscription it's a really good um, uh, online um, reference podcast and they have 
has started the very first emergency medicine online textbook or manual which is being continuously updated all the time and it's made in an easy to access way so it has a rapid access part which is free which is uh, you can always refer up and then a deep dive or a very detailed discussion that you can use to learn topics there so check out Copendium and check out the chapters and you can also get the calculators there as well. And this is the rapid access part for a trauma management, so which is usually freely accessible, but you will the rest of it will be hidden behind a paywall. But just check the MRAP Go website and apply and see if you're able to get access to that. And last, now artificial intelligence is something that people are talking much here. Um, and application of that in so application of that in medical uh, medicine so they're thinking talking about artificial intelligence in reading ECGs and giving you the diagnosis uh, reading x-rays or you know going through patients vitals and giving you all this diagnosis or some clues but again it's a long way to go and in Sri Lankan setup it's going to take much time to afford it or set it up so it will take some time and the other issue is artificial intelligence is as good as uh, the person using it so you can can't take even though it gives good values most of the time it still has chance to get things wrong so you still have to be very careful but saying that I would suggest for you to um, be familiar with the chat GPT it's really interesting because we have been playing about with it you can ask it to uh, make you summary sheets for patient uh, like uh, patient discharge advices and it really does it in a good neat way you can even ask it to make songs I mean you can do funny things with you can ask it to make songs about patient advice on patient discharge it still does it uh, but please make sure it's accurate and um, always go through that because like once you become familiar with it you'll understand it tend to repeat certain things again and again so uh, you have to be careful that your patient does not get the wrong uh, message to be taken home uh, and other users I got colleagues who had used it to come like summarize big data so one of my colleagues actually summarized the 22 to to act uh, uh, the parliament parliament act and gave it a summary to me through Ch chat GPT. so there's lots of things that you can do with that that brings us to the end of the question uh, like uh, discussion and I'll be happy to take any questions if you got them uh, thank you so much sir, for that uh, wonderful and very precise lecture it was a lot of information but to the point and I'm sure uh, if you can make use of these available apps and uh, websites as relevant to our clinical pr practice we would be immensely benefited uh, we have got a couple of questions uh, from the audience uh, which was sent to us before the lecture itself. Uh, so are you available with us? Sir? Yeah, sure. I'm here. Uh, Go sure. ahead. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So the first question is uh, uh, how to handle inquiries over social media without assessing the patient clinically? All right. Look, that's a good question um, because uh, you need to know... Uh, no, a certain, I mean, there are a bit of uh, guidelines on addressing or, you know, doing this in social media. There's a good one from GMC, which you can read. So the, basically the gist of it is uh, you have to sort of maintain patient confidentiality. You need to keep your boundaries between the patient care and, and the patient. So, and also you have to be respectful with your colleagues as uh, about your colleagues as well. So, look, if the patient is asking you about any clinical issues, you can't really do that over social media. You need to sort of politely decline and ask them to, uh, you know, go and see a doctor face to face. Saying that, uh, you have to realize whatever you say or do in social media, even if it's private messaging, that's going to be there permanently for some time. So, if you are running into any issues, that record will be there permanently. Uh, so, and the other question comes is, whether you're going to add your patients or, you know, uh, patients under your care as you, uh, in your friend list, that's also a tricky thing. So just like what, uh, you know, le you learn from SLMC or this thing, uh, if the patient is still under your care, you should not be, you know, engaging them in the social uh, media. Uh, I couldn't, I, I don't think we got anything updated from SLMC, like a document or anything, but uh, if you just go through or search for, uh, uh, GMC's social media guideline for doctors, they are they given a good uh, summary for you there. Thank you, sir. Hope it answers the question. And the second question is, I think, sir, you also mentioned that in the lecture, application mm -hmm. of AI tools in the patient management. That's a yeah. question which has come from. Uh, yeah. Yes, so sir, do, you, do you mean to tell how to use the AI, is it? Uh, 
uh, so yeah. the question itself is is uh, the application of ai tools in patient management all right okay um, other applications? so application of ai is a bit tricky so look you got uh, about three options at the moment you got chat gpt 3.5 which is free but you only got uh, it's it's not connected to the google search or any search engine it's only up to date up to 2022 you got chat gpt 4.0 which you know you had to pay a monthly fee about 20 dollars per month uh it's sort of bit better then and you got the google bard which is free but saying that uh would i use the ai in patient care that's a tricky uh question because in emergency situations or any clinical situation i would rather rely on uh in the usual good old history examination investigation as well as you know the textbook or the app so what you know like a written thing uh because ai will would be able to give a summary but you know it depends on what sources it reads from so ourselves like when when we read the sources then we we usually get an idea whether that source is credible or not so but if ai doesn't really know so if you don't uh specify the sources so you know this thing will be troublesome but what you can do is uh, so what i tend to do is like if there's a large article or you know multiple sites or whatever what i tend to do is you just copy paste the information into the ai on chat gpt then ask it to sort of summarize so you know take all the salient information and sort of gives it to you uh so that's something that you can use the second thing that i do is when you want to send so especially from an emergency department point of view when you want to send patients home we would prefer to send them form with uh, you know a bit of uh, information on uh, like in sheet or anything so uh, especially given in sri lanka you know you need to give it in sinhalese or tamil uh, what i tend to do is just copy paste the information you can ask the uh, ai to sort of write it for you so it will search and give it to you you review this make sure there's no mistakes then you can use you know ask the app to translate itself or use google translate and give it to them so that would work so you can use it to sort of get the summary so give to information but in acute patient management i would say better not depend on it because uh you don't know where the ai is getting its data from so you had to be careful in that all right thank you uh so the other question is like you mentioned uh, regarding pill uh, apps like pill identifier from medscape to identify the uh, unknown drugs so is yeah. there anything of that sort to identify the syrups which are not labeled uh, i don't think so <laughs> uh because look it depends on what color and all this stuff i don't think it's going to be effective with the syrups okay. uh it, it will be difficult yeah but then again clinically like uh for a management point of view if it's an overdose clinically we usually look at the toxidomes and go along with that so i don't think it will cause uh any issues i mean we, if you, if we know the drug it make things easier otherwise you're just going to manage clinically you're going to look at toxicology and look at uh, monitoring and stuff uh and you know probably 24 observation so it usually helps by that time yeah okay so do thank you sir those are the uh, so we got one more question right now uh, what are yeah. the legal aspects of patient management and prescription of medicine using um, video consultation like odo All right. Uh, I don't have personal experience with ODOC. Uh, so I mean, I'm sorry that I don't have personal experience. I can't really say for them. But the general idea is, if we are using a, a, a how do you say a platform like that, which is you know made for telemedicine, uh, you would see that they should give a disclaimer, uh, you know, something to sign up saying that you know I agree to the services provided by this by this. Uh, portal or whatever and you know i agree to get this uh prescription you know so and so so usually if the, they would have, uh, sort of manage the legal aspect so if that you know setting is there then uh you should be able to prescribe medications uh through the site but saying that uh, i mean we all know that there are limitations which i mean not physically examining the patient so odoc is usually use i mean i would say order but these are usually useful for like nearly 80 to 90% of the people whom you don't really need to do like a thorough examination like you know like uh, in your face direct uh, uh, diagnosis so which you can use for like your cough and cold and stuff but if it comes if it becomes bit too technical then uh, you may need to redirect them to a hospital so in that scenario so if you are going to give just basic medication uh, i 
uh, I think you would be covered. Uh, and I think if, if you're going to use this uh, platform sort of to uh, telemedicine, I think we, you should also go through the, the legal disclaimer that given the uh, uh, give before signing up as well, like what are your rights and what are covered up with. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know personally about ODOC, but uh, I suppose we can always find from the website and see what we are entitled to. All right, sir. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, hope uh, those are the questions for the day, sir. So let mm. me take a moment to uh, give my sincere thanks to Dr. N. Prasanna, consultant emergency physician, accident service lady Ridgeway Hospital for Children, for his excellent lecture and precious time. Um, and for the audience, uh, thank you for joining us and for your patient's participation. Please find the link in the chat box for the Google form. And uh, yeah, give your feedbacks and the post, answer the post assessment questions and receive your e-certificate for participation. So we invite you to come back every Sunday and um, join in and give you a continuous update. Thank you. Thank you, guys.